who ever heard of a church that uh, is supposed to be like quiet during the summertime, right? We've had baptisms and I think there's been a lunch here the last two weeks with our picnic and newcomers luncheon. Um, there's just been so much going on with VBS and now with mission strip. It's like, yeah, we don't do anything around here in the summer. <laughs> it works great, doesn't it? Well, Lord willing, next month we'll uh, get charged up for uh, uh, the fall and the ministries that'll be happening uh, in September. Um, but until then, we continue on in serving the Lord. I just want to encourage you, if you need a Bible this morning, these fine gentlemen would love to put one in your hands. We are in the book of 2 Thessalonians this morning, actually the last message in a series that began actually uh, back at the beginning of our year. Um, there's been a lot of different things that have gone on during that period of time, and, and we're just coming to the end here looking at chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians. Paul has written First and Second Thessalonians. His theme has been faith, hope, and love. He has been writing to a group of individuals who have had some concerns. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns that they have had over those who have died and now are where, and they wanted to know, are they going to miss out on the, the kingdom of God? And so Paul is very effective in trying to make sure that they understood uh, something called a rapture back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We come to chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians and Paul has been speaking to the issue of end times and he talks about the fact that, listen, the day of the Lord has not appeared yet. It hasn't occurred. Uh, you'll know it by these signs. And we've gone through some great prophecy the last few weeks and just dealing with uh, some of the signs of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now Paul is going to conclude uh, this great epistle, and he begins there in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, and that we'll be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have the faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Well, the Apostle Paul has much to say, and we pray that we will be able to learn from him as he wraps this up and gives us some important truths that we need to stop and consider. For I believe that what's in front of us is a description of the disciplined Christian life. Let's look to the Lord, shall we? God, we praise you for there is none like you. You've given to us, Lord, your word. You've put the grace of God into our hearts. And we rejoice, Lord, because of the faith that we have in you, the newness of life. Lord, what a joy it is for Christians to be able to stop and consider what their Savior has done for them. May you just bless the word of God now as we consider the disciplined Christian life and we look at the different aspects, Father, that you've called us to action on. May we learn, may we grow as we embrace your word this morning. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we have this little parapet here. It reminds me of that story about the preacher who was preaching in Revelation, and he kept preaching, and he said, Behold, I come! And he didn't get much of a rise out of the people. And so he walked to the other side, and he said, Behold, I come! And another, everybody's sitting there. And he said, Behold, I come! And when he said that, he, he stepped off, and the stage broke, and he fell into the front row and landed in this woman's lap. <laughs> And he says, I am so, so very sorry. And she said, I don't know what you're sorry about. You warned us three times. <laughs> Here in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is going to deal with the disciplined life. And the disciplined life and the life of the Christian is, is something that we need to understand. Because it's something that's new to us as followers of Jesus Christ. I put myself back into the scenario of the Thessalonican church. These are newer people that have rec recognized their need for Christ. They heard when Paul came that Jesus, the Messiah, had come. And now all of a sudden, their life is really being changed. And there's a new discipline that is beginning to present itself. And they are going to be required to follow in that new discipline. Our Christian lives are truly lives of Christian discipline. I think of life as a whole. 
And I think of life as it's been for all of us. There's been different times in our life when disciplines have become important to us or necessary or both. I remember as a young person, isn't it cool when you come into the world as a little baby, nothing, you could do whatever you want. You know what I mean? I mean, when a baby cries because it's hungry, no one says, oh, he's just being selfish. Um, no, they say feed him. Uh, if he's got a wet diaper, they say, we'll change his diaper. Maybe that will make him happy. And, and that's just a grand time to be alive. <laughs> I, I remember when I had to go to school, day one. How many remember your first day of school? Yes, your first day of prison, I mean school. <laughs> Life has just been so much bliss. I, I get up in the morning when I wanna get up. I go and play with my army men until whatever. I go outside and play. My mother would say, be back for lunch. Now, those of you who are my age can relate to that, but those of you who are younger, you'd never say to your children nowadays, right? I mean, go out and play and have a good time. And we were climbing trees, and we were building forts, and we were digging holes, and, and we did all kinds of cool stuff. We had lots of woods out behind. We climbed vines to see if we could get a glimpse into that squirrel's nest from 30 feet. We did all of those kind of fun things, and then I had to go to school. It was traumatic. <laughs> Baby boomers had come along. We had one elementary school, and, and so we, it was divided up. You either went in the morning or you went in the afternoon, and I was always a morning person, and so by the time noon is coming around, my day is mostly over, and I had to go to school. I'd eat my lunch. Instead of going out to play, I had to go to school. And I go into this room, and there's a whole bunch of other weird kids there, and all of a sudden, you have this teacher, and she's standing up front, and she's telling you stuff. And for some reason, it's resonating in my mind that I'm needing to remember this. I'm going to have to pay attention. My mind would escape as I sat there in class, just in the kindergarten class. My mind would be everywhere, mostly outside, chasing something. All of a sudden, I realized my life was, was newly disciplined. And when I came to the point in my life where I got my first job, I remember getting that first job and, and working, and I thought, this is just fantastic. I was about 13 and a half years old. I remember my dad saying to me, Kevin, I don't know why you want a job. You've got your whole life to work, he kept telling me that. You've got your whole life to work. But I, I wanted the money, and so I went to work. And I remember that, that first collision where there was a Sunday afternoon, there was a youth activity that was going on, and I couldn't go because I had to go to work. See, the disciplined life began to take shape. And so bosses come along and all of that, and eventually I got married, and that's all I'm going to say about the... <laughs> you're not single anymore. You're, you're, it's the disciplined life, Right? Well, think of the Thessalonians. It's a good life. It's a great life. <laughs> Same thing is true with the Christian life. These people never knew what it was like to live the Christian life. And all of a sudden, these new disciplines are coming into our life. We are bombarded, is it not so, with disciplines. We need to exercise. You go to the doctors for a checkup. He wants you to do this. He wants you to do that. You know, the, the, all around us, we're bombarded. And so when we come to the Christian life and you come to these believers here in Thessalonian, uh, the Thessalonian church, you realize that they don't know these disciplines. These are new. These are things that are just hitting them for the first time. And, and all of a sudden, there's these aspects of Christian life that needed to be added to their life. And they need to take these things seriously. They need to follow through with them because life is now different. You and I as followers of Jesus must maintain a disciplined lifestyle that reflects the will of God concerning us. How are we going to do that? There's three areas here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I want you to see these three disciplines. The first discipline is the discipline of prayer. Paul begins here in verse 1, chapter 3, and he says this. He says, finally, brethren, he's coming to a conclusion. These are his concluding remarks. He says, finally, brethren, 
pray for us. Pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified. Paul is asking for prayer. Paul very rarely asks for prayer for himself. He is usually, when he requests prayer, praying that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth. He would sometimes pray for boldness, to be able to have the boldness necessary to get the gospel out. Here in this sequence, Paul prays specifically that the word of God will spread rapidly. Literally, he's saying it needs to run. The word of God needs to run. And what is in his mind, no doubt, is a metaphor of a, an athlete who is racing around the track. Maybe you've been watching the Olympics, uh, the trials that have been going on. You see these people on the track, and they're off and they are running. The gospel of Jesus Christ begins to spread rapidly after Christ ascends into heaven. By the time you come to Acts chapter 2, there are thousands of people who are coming to faith in Christ. The gospel is rapidly expanding. Paul is taking the word of God, and it is finding root in towns like Thessaloniki. And here we find that Paul's main concern is that the gospel of Jesus Christ would somehow be halted or slow down. And so he prays. He says, I want you to pray specifically that the gospel will spread rapidly, that it will run, and we would specifically pray that it would be glorified. Now, what does he mean when he says it should be glorified? Well, I believe that there are certain inherent qualities with regard to the gospel. The gospel, that good news, that's what the word gospel means, good news is something that is marvelous. It is the gospel according to grace. We don't do anything in order to be saved other than place our faith in Jesus. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has done all the work for our salvation. Jesus Christ nailed my sin to the cross. He took upon himself the sins of the whole world, in fact, and now he has paid that price and he has resurrected from the dead, showing forth his victory over death. What a joy. And this is the inherent qualities of the gospel. And so the gospel gospel should be glorified and it should, we pray, spread rapidly. There were those who would seek to hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Paul references that here. He says, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men. There are those who do not have the faith. There is a spiritual warfare that's taking place with regard to the spread of the gospel. You remember when Paul is is going along and he he ends up there in in Thessalonica and and things go well in the beginning and people are turning and placing their faith in Jesus. But what ends up happening is so impactful because the resistance comes from the Jewish leadership in the town and they are actually forcing him out and he has to leave. Do you remember that from 1 Thessalonians? He has to go on the run and get away from there. Why? Because there's always a battle for men's souls. And there are evil and there are perverse people who would like to see the gospel shut down. There is a spiritual battle and I want you to note here that what Paul is talking about is profound because of the opportunity that you and I have to pray. Over in Colossians, in Colossians chapter four, the Bible tells us there that we should be devoted to prayer, Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourself, he says, to prayer. That's part of the Christian uh, discipline. All of a sudden, it's something that we really didn't know much about. Before you came and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, prayer was probably a 911 call for you. That's probably what it was. Uh, most people, that's how they pray. I remember my grandmother, she's, uh, she was Roman Catholic, and she used to have a stack of prayers that she would read every single morning at 6 a.m. She would go through them, and she would always t- stop and look at the, the, the prayer for JFK, and she'd say, yeah, I really need to do this one, and she'd go back down through the list. And... Uh, There are people who do that as part of their religion. There are people who pray. There are people, uh, Muslims, who will pray. But most people here in our own communities and our own world, the times when they pray is when life is really off the track. When there's some serious issue or there's some serious desire, then we all of a sudden pray. That's different than this prayer. 
This prayer here that Paul is asking the Thessalonian Christians to partake in is part of the discipline of the Christian life. Devote yourself to prayer, Paul would say over in Colossians. And so as a believer, I am introduced to the fact that prayer changes things. God would not ask us as church, as his church, to pray if it didn't matter. There's a spiritual battle going on. This is God's word. God is saying, you need to pray. You need to pray. And he says, in his reminder to them that God is faithful. The Lord's faithful. He'll strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Remember, the first discipline is the discipline of prayer. We come to God and we pray because prayer today as it always has, truly makes a difference. Now for the Thessalonians, they didn't know this as part of their life. They're adding this to their life. All of a sudden it becomes a point of importance. And maybe you're here today and I can challenge you to pray. I can challenge you to take the time in your life to come before the Lord in prayer on a regular basis. We're so busy that we oftentimes forget about prayer, don't we? We, we think, well, just, you know, we're driving down the highway, we're in the left lane doing faster than we should, and all of a sudden, yeah, let me pray. We don't have that quiet time, that, that time with God where we, we avail ourselves of the power of prayer, and it becomes a discipline in our Christian life. The second discipline is the discipline of obedience. Notice here in verse four, Paul says, we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. The discipline of obedience is something that's, that's new to them as well. Up until this time, they may have had to obey their parents when they were little. They obeyed their bosses if they had a job answering to someone higher up. But all of a sudden, I need to obey God. All of a sudden, there's someone bigger than me that I'm going to give an account to, and so all of a sudden, my life is changed. It's part of the Christian life. It's part of the discipline of the Christian life, isn't it? Obeying God. Paul says, I have this, this confidence in you. Paul was confident that the church of, of the Thessalonians would indeed continue on this, but notice his confidence. If you look very clear, carefully at verse four, he says, we have confidence in them or someone else. We have confidence in the Lord. Do you see that there? We have confidence in the Lord. You, you see, the work that God is doing in the lives of these church people is really impactful. And we know the power of God, and we know how well God changes lives. God is, is saying here, I can do anything with you. You come to me and you follow me and God is saying, I can shape you into the person that I want you to be. God can do that with every single one of us. Isn't that neat? And these Thessalonian believers, Paul is saying, I, I have confidence. I, I have a, a settled persuasion about you. I, I am truly persuaded in my heart and mind that you will continue to follow after the commands of the Lord. This is what marks them and what drives them is there in the next verse where Paul just simply says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. The love of God is really what motivates us. It's absolutely essential. The commands there are important, but how do we fulfill these commands? How do we go about obeying the Lord? What do I need to do? If I asked you today, you know, how, I, how are you doing with obeying the things of God? You might say to yourself, well, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that I'm not doing and that I need to be doing. And you say to yourself, well, is it a question of just motivating myself somehow to go about obeying God in a more precise manner. What's necessary? What's missing? And I would submit to you that what is missing is exactly what Paul is praying about here when he says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and in the steadfastness of Christ. What drives you and me 
to obey the commands of God is quite simply our love for God. Our, our love for God. When we don't love God as much as we should, we tend to love other things and we love the world. Love not the world, things in the world. The love of the world is going to take us away from where we want to be. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father, it says, is not in him. And so the problem is we don't love God enough. You see, you and I need to focus on God and and. and Paul is saying here, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. This is what he's talking about. We want you to be more and more in love with God all the time. The disciplined Christian life should not be a burden. I'll tell you what a burden is. A burden is getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go exercise. That's a burden, right? Say, oh, yeah, great. Oh, it feels great. Roll out. Oh, yuck. It's eating that cereal that tastes like cardboard. That, that's, that's not fun. The Christian life is not meant to be a burden. Those things are burdens. Christian life is meant to be fluid and joyous. The more I love God, the more I want to obey him. Do you see the cor- correlation? I mean, it's just tied together so nicely. The more I love God, the more I'm going to want to talk to him. I'm going to pray. And the more I pray, the more I see God interacting with me. I see, I see answers to prayer. I see things that, that truly get me excited about him. You see, the problem isn't, isn't that the commands of God are just burdensome, and I'm going through these pages, and I'm going, oh, yeah, he wants me to do that, and he wants me to do that, and I'm supposed to live like this, and I'm supposed to do that. I mean, this long list, and, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. What motivates us is the love of Christ. I love God, and so I want to be obedient to him. It's part of the discipline of the Christian life. If I could say to you, what is the biggest problem that you and I have as Christians? It's the fact that we don't love God as we should. I need to love him more. And Paul says, my prayer is that You'd be directed, and your hearts would embrace the love of God. It's part of that Christian discipline. How many of you here are grandparents? So isn't it cool that when you see your grandchild for the first time, you all of a sudden love this person who's never really existed before? It's like, it's like all of a sudden in your life, you're going through life and everything's great and you've got your, you've got your children and uh, you've got your family and everything else and you feel like, you know, you're pretty well rounded out, you know? And then all of a sudden this new little child comes in and all of a sudden you find that you have love in your heart for this brand new child. Isn't that cool? Happens with your own children too, of course. It's just so neat. It's like I didn't love you before and now... You're so important. If you can relate to that, then relate as well to the fact that we love Christ now because we understand his love for us. All of a sudden, because I've placed my faith in Christ and I understand he loved me before the foundations of the world even, he loved me and he loved me so much that he'd go and die and live for me. I love him. Before, I didn't even know him. But now I couldn't live without him. You see the difference? The love of Christ needs to be that motivational factor for us. Well, the discipline of prayer is important. The discipline uh, of obedience is, is hugely significant. Significant. And the third point here, we pick this up in verse six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, not according to the traditions which you received from us. I believe that this last discipline, and I'm putting it here because I believe that there are differences in how the apostle is addressing these who are living an unruly life in 2 Thessalonians. There's a slight difference there uh, between this and some of the other places in Scripture where the Bible teaches very clearly that you have to take a position against someone who is in sin. 
And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to term this as the third discipline. This is the discipline of discipleship. You and I are called to be disciplers. There's a time in our life when we're discipled. In fact, we probably never are without that ongoing process of discipleship that's taking place. But we're also called to disciple others. When you think about discipleship, what do you think about? Well, we oftentimes, when we talk about discipleship in the church, discipleship is generally thought of as me teaching you. Uh, teaching you from a book study, teaching you from a new believer's Bible course, something along those lines. But I would submit to you that discipleship is even greater than just the teaching from a book. Discipleship is teaching people how to live the Christian life and how to apply the disciplines of the Christian life. Because what we need is we need a very practical guide. What's happening here in this passage of scripture, you ask? Well, here's what's happening. There are those in the church that evidently uh, were pretty fired up about the return of Jesus Christ. I mean, the Apostle Paul, he's always talking about the imminency of the return of Christ, right? I mean, he's, he's, that's the way he lives, it's the way he teaches, and so people are without a doubt, you know, looking forward to the return of Jesus. How many here are looking forward to the return of Jesus? Yeah, amen. How many think it's going to be pretty soon? Okay. How many of you are thinking of quitting your jobs because you really think it's going to be soon? <laughs> okay. That's the point here in this passage. You see, the instance that we're dealing with here are people who are revved up about the return of Jesus. Now, I got to put you back in time a little bit. We have the ascension of Jesus into glory after the resurrection. We have hundreds of people, literally, who are walking around who have come forth from the tombs in Jerusalem. And they came forth when the resurrection took place of Jesus. Pretty impactful, right? All of a sudden, by the time you come to Acts chapter 2, you've got this expansive, expansive gospel. You have a, a gospel that's expanding, not only in Jerusalem, uh, where thousands of people are coming to faith, but it's starting to go worldwide. Paul is taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to Asia Minor. People are getting saved, and the gospel is flowing. It is an exciting time. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, you know, we're looking forward to the rapture of the church. That's the next thing that's going to happen. Trump of God is going to sound. Dead in Christ are going to rise first. We who which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. Amen. And so people are looking at this time frame and they're sitting there thinking to themselves, some of them, that, well, you know, this is a great idea. I think I'm just going to quit my work and just wait for Jesus to come back. And Paul, who is as I mentioned, really on that cutting edge of live like this is the last day, has to set an example because he knows that no man knows the day or the hour. And that is the reality that he needs to convince them of. So go a little further in this passage and you'll see what I mean. Paul says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Well, what was his example? We didn't act, he says, in an undisciplined manner among you. We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working day and night, so we wouldn't be a burden to any of you. Not because we didn't have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. Paul is very, very clear. He says, I was entitled to be paid. But he said, the reason why I didn't take any money is because I wanted to be an example to all of you, and so I worked, and we know Paul was a tent maker, so he's working night and day, he's very busy with the trade, and he's very busy in discipling the believers. And so his ministry is, is one of setting forth an example. What's his example? His example is that you and I have to work until the time when Jesus Christ returns. We're not advocating that we sell all of our belongings, go up onto a high mountain, because this is the moment in time when Jesus is going to appear. Some cults have done that. They've been very misguided. Unfortunately, it has led to people being very discouraged. Paul is saying, I don't know when Jesus is going to return, but in the meantime, I'm going to do everything that I can to live a disciplined Christian life. 
as opposed, he says, to those who are unruly. Notice back there in verse 6, he's talking about those who are leading an unruly life or an undisciplined life. That speaks of a soldier who is breaking ranks. Everybody's going in the right direction. They're obeying the commands of the superior officer, and there's one soldier who won't obey. We're all going to the left. Let's go to the left, and he goes to the right. This is the one who is unruly. Not only were these unruly, but we find that there were other difficulties as well. Paul says in verse 10, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. This is what I used to say, Paul says. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. In other words, there is no obligation that you have to feed those in the church who refuse to work. These weren't, I don't think, bad people. In fact, Paul is going to make it very, very clear. These are brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. I wonder what it, I wonder what it looked like back in those days. You come to church, you know, and everybody's praising God, and it's an exciting time, and people are coming to faith in Christ. And you just have some of these people who, who say, yeah, Jesus is coming. He's coming this week. And that's their reasoning for not working. <laughs> you know, and, and they get all, oh, they're, they're just passionate, and they're gushing about Christ and his return. And uh, by the way, um, they pop in at your house around supper time. Remember, it's not a question of having a roof over their head. There were no mortgages back in those days. Isn't that great? Um, people, you know, they, they built their house. Somebody built it, and family probably, and they lived there. But they, they had to have food. I mean, that's what they were needing. And so they'd come over to talk about Jesus and get a bite to eat with you. And it started to wear thin. And there started to be tensions in the church. And so Paul says, listen, they're not to be included in the the love feast and the communion time. He says, we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. The word busybody is a compound word. Uh, the, the prefix part of it is peri. It's the idea of around. They were working around. Literally, that's what he's saying. They were working around. They weren't doing the work they were supposed to do. They were doing all this other work that they were not supposed to do. They almost thought of themselves perhaps as, as being ministers of the word, but they really weren't doing what they were supposed to do. In fact, Paul makes it very clear that what they were supposed to be doing was providing for their own families and being excited about the return of the Lord. That's what was necessary, but because they weren't doing that, it was creating a problem. Now such, he says, persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Oh. Before you're too, too hard on these people, remember, Paul is writing this letter, but who is Paul? Oh, well, he was here. He, you know, gave us the gospel and so forth, and they call him an apostle, but, you know, Paul, you know, you didn't wasn't walking with Jesus, wasn't one of the 12 disciples, and so you might be sitting there wondering, here we are today, we have 2 Thessalonians, and it's in the canon of Scripture, it's God's Word, it's the inspired Word of God that we have, and we follow it implicitly. But they had questions about whether or not Paul maybe had the right answer here, and so Paul was very, very clear, here's the commands, they need to follow through, and they need to work. Paul would say, keep away from them, disfellowship with them, set yourself back from them. And he gives the remedy to the problem and he instructs them to work in a quiet fashion. He's talking there about a tranquility of spirit, a peace that comes over them so that they can eat their own bread. I love it in the scriptures where the Bible talks about living a quiet and peaceable life. It just seems like that's what God wants us to do. We live in a world today which is so busy, we're humming 100 miles an hour. Like I mentioned, when's the time supposed to be there in the Christian's disciplined life where we can just simply get away with God, get away with God and say, God, you know, speak to my heart. Where do we find time to pray? Where do we find time to, to get into his word and just let the word of God speak to our hearts? 
It seems this is the model that God wants for us. I think the busyness of our schedule today is the opposite of what God really wants from us. We get around people, we say, you know, well, how's it going? Oh, good, good, busy, busy. I mean, seriously, when was the last time you said to somebody, hey, how's it going? They said, oh, great, I just had a really relaxing week where I was able to spend time with the Lord and, you know, got, away, got, got alone with God. And, you know, I mean, we got to have to sign up for a retreat and we have to go 500 miles away on a weekend in order to be able to have 20 minutes alone with God. It's just, this is the world that, that, that's really messed up. That's not what God says he wants for us at all. God says, I want you to be able to come and fellowship with me. I want you to be able to spend time in prayer. I want you to have that quiet and peaceable life. This is what he wants for these people. But he instructs them and he says, listen, he said, uh, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him. The word associate means to mix and mingle. He says, don't, don't mix and mingle. Someone after the first service asked me, well, does that mean we, we shouldn't admonish people that are living an undisciplined, unruly life? Well, the key here, as he mentions the word admonish, means to place in someone's mind. Once they know what the reality is, the truth is, then it's their responsibility to follow through with that. Part of discipleship is placing into people's minds, here's what God's word says, here's the will of God concerning this. If they refuse to do that, in this situation, Paul is saying, withdraw yourself from them. Don't associate with them. Don't, don't treat them like a brother in the sense that there's nothing wrong. Go out and yuck it up with them. Instead, he says, withdraw from them so that they'll feel ashamed. The word there, ashamed, means to look inward, literally. And the idea is that there would be introspection that would take place. They would look deep into their own heart and life and, and analyze, what am I doing that these people won't fellowship with me? What am I doing wrong that I know to be true? And hopefully at that point, they come to the realization that, well, this really isn't the will of God, and I really am going to need to go out and seek to work to put bread on the table. Now, it's important that we follow God's prescription in every situation. We never know better than God. This is what God says we should do. But he makes note of this. He says in that verse 15, yet he says, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as brother. There's a difference, I believe, here with this, and you, you, for sake of time, we don't have the time to go there, but, but in Matthew 18, and he's talking here about a, a sinner, if someone sins against you, and you, know, you bring this to their knowledge, and you, you go to them seeking restoration, they refuse to be restored. It's a situation where ultimately you withdraw your affirmation of their, even their salvation. That's what he's telling them to do in Matthew 18. Well, that's pretty heavy. What's the difference? You come to, for instance, Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 says, mark those who cause divisions among you, and he's making that very clear. Well, here in this situation, I believe the need here is for more discipleship. It's not as though they're breaking the law of God, as you would see in Matthew 18, because Matthew 18, Jesus is teaching, you're going back to things like the Ten Commandments, they could be breaking one of the Ten Commandments, they could be breaking Jesus' teaching. Here, these people need to be discipled. And as I mentioned, my, my guess, and I could be wrong, but my guess is that they simply were enthusiastic about God and were missing the point of what God wanted them to do. And so gently, we work with people to disciple them, teaching them from the scripture and showing them from a disciplined Christian life what their life's supposed to be looking like. It's important because the, the, the outcome that's anticipated is in that next verse. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. What God is looking for in the body of Christ is a peace, uh, that quietness, that tranquility. That, that's what God seeks for his, his followers, to live in peace among each other. And the tension here would be real. If I, I, on purpose, I skip verse 13. I want you to go back there to verse 13. Just notice that with me. As for you, brethren, he says, do not grow weary 
of doing good. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't, don't quit because others around you are discouraging you by their behavior. Paul would also say this over in Galatians. Don't be weary in well-doing. We need to be reminded that our eyes need to be on Jesus Christ. There are those who are going to live a very undisciplined Christian life. Many, many Christians never really pray. They never even realize the significance of prayer for the gospel to be spread. Many, many Christians live in direct disobedience to Christ, lacking very much a love, a deep love for Christ. These people can be very discouraging to those who are seeking to, to truly be the disciple and live a disciplined Christian life before God. They can become discouraged. And Paul is saying here, guys, don't have a weariness of heart. Don't get discouraged. Keep on going. Because at the end of it all, God is faithful. The Lord is faithful, it says in verse three, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. The disciplined Christian life, something that they probably didn't know much about. They needed to, to hear this message. They needed to understand that there were things that were being introduced to their life now that hinged on their relationship with Jesus Christ, things that were gonna change. And you and I as disciples of Christ are very familiar with these things today because of the period of time that's gone by since the word of God was given. And we should never take it for granted either. May we live a disciplined Christian life that is pleasing to the Lord. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. What a joy, what a blessing it is to go through Thessalonians. And just as a little side note, a little rabbit trail, if you, you wouldn't mind me just taking this rabbit trail. That disgusting clock gives me two minutes. I'm going to take them, right? So here's the, right at the end, ever wondered who wrote Hebrews? Have you ever wondered that? Yeah, I wonder who wrote Hebrews. Well, notice with me here, the last verse says, the, 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 or Paul in verse 17, I write this greeting with my own hand, Paul says. This is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Remember, Paul was, was probably, uh, you know, there were some forgeries written and so forth. And Paul says, listen, you know that I wrote this because this is how I, conclude every one of my writings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You flip over to 1 Timothy, just kind of fly over it, and you see, what does Paul end with? Grace be with you. You go to 2 Timothy, it says, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you. You go to Titus, he wrote Titus, it says, grace be with you all. Philemon, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You come to the end of Hebrews, and at the end of Hebrews, what does it say there? If I could find it, I'll read it. Grace be with you all. Hmm, isn't that interesting? And you can go all the way back through Philippians and Colossians, and you can go all the way through Corinthians, and you'll end up there at Romans, and you come to Romans, and you'll say, oh, I knew it. He doesn't end that way. And then you gotta read a few verses beforehand because it almost seems like he actually mentions it twice in Romans. Grace be with you all. And then God gives him a little bit more uh, inspiration and he has a little paragraph that he needs to write. And then he, then he concludes. But you know, God has uh, blessed us with his word. And uh, I believe the Apostle Paul has been used marvelously uh, to convey to us what the disciplined Christian life really does look like. Would you stand with me, please? We'll have a word of prayer. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll have the shearing of the sheep. <laughs> Steve's not old enough yet. When he gets to be my age, he'll be wanting to keep his hair. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you loved us and you've given to us, Lord, instruction as to how to live an abundant Christian life. Lord, help us to realize the importance today of loving you more. That the love that we have for you would just truly excite us about being obedient and praying. That would truly drive us, Lord, uh, in great ways. That we would be truly found faithful, Lord. 
Help us, Lord, as we go from this place to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Lord, how I lift uh, up these who are here today and pray for them, Lord, throughout this coming week to love you more. And if there's anyone here who's not sure of their eternal destination, may they truly seek that answer before they leave here. May they truly come to a, a personal faith in Jesus Christ and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are on their way to heaven. Father, we thank you for the word of God. May you minister to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen.